Great. So welcome, everyone. Uh, today we have with us uh, Tim Goodship uh, from Newcastle University, uh, and we really appreciate him uh, joining us. Um, my name is Rob Platika, and I work as a community manager with Eurodis. Uh, I've been working with the patient groups um, for a typical HUS now for a few years. Uh, and so we've gotten to know uh, a little bit about the disease. Uh, and I wanted to just quickly present the atypical HUS community on Rare Connect, on uh, some of the things that we've done uh, recently. And then Dr. Goodship is going to present uh, his experience with atypical HUS in the UK. OK. Uh, so this is the homepage of the atypical HUS community on rareconnect.org. You can easily find it from there. Uh, it's an international community with human translation across five languages, English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. So we have people living with atypical HUS from around the world sharing their stories, uh, sharing their experiences on that community. And we invite anyone to uh, join uh, who's affected by atypical HUS or has a loved one uh, affected by atypical HUS uh, and take part in the conversations there. Uh, I want to give a, a thanks to all the atypical HUS patient groups who have been partners in the ReConnect community uh, and who have uh, really uh, helped to, to support uh, global networking uh, amongst themselves and amongst patients. Um, on the community, uh, we have some interesting uh, articles uh, that I just want to quickly draw your attention to. Um, Yeah, so uh, here on the, uh, from the homepage, you can uh, now, as of today, view the global poll commentary. Um, Dr. Uh, Goodship is also going to comment on the global poll that we did uh, on living with atypical HUS at the end of uh, his presentation. Uh, you can find the full results uh, of the poll here uh, and read through those. Uh, we had 214 total responses. Uh, and you can see the infographic there uh, on the atypical HUS community on Rare Connect as well, uh, which is a visual representation of some of the results uh, of the poll. Uh, and the purpose of this poll was really just to help the um, atypical HUS patient groups uh, better understand the issue that uh, people living with the disease we're facing. Um, so that's uh, all I have, uh, and I just thank you for joining um, us. And now I'm going to bring, uh, throw it over to Dr. Goodship, who's going to go through uh, some slides uh, here today and talk about uh, atypical, atypical HUS in the UK. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rob, and uh, hello to everybody. It's the afternoon here, 2 p.m. in the UK, and I think there's people from all over the world joining us, so hello to everybody. So what I'm going to do over the next little while is tell you about my experience with atypical HUS, tell you about a little bit about what's been happening recently in England, and then make some comments about the global poll. So I've been interested in atypical HS for nearly over 20 years. And it's really because of this one family in the northeast of England, and in particular this one surviving affected individual um, uh, in the family uh, that caused my interest in the disease over 20 years ago. I think it's fair to say at that time we just didn't know what caused this disease. And this particular individual, who I think Sean is online with us, so hi Sean, um, is the only surviving affected individual of this family, and this is him presenting his history to our local paper, the Newcastle Evening Chronicle. There are certain things about Sean's family that are relevant to other families. So everybody in this family who developed the disease did not recover kidney function after the first time that they developed the disease. There were four individuals within this family who had a kidney transplant, and each of them, the disease recurred almost immediately, and the transplanted kidney was lost. There are, as you can see, so each of the, the, the boxes that are, are filled, um, draw a pen here, each of these represents somebody who's affected. 
whereas a, an open box here represents somebody who's unaffected. Um, one thing you can see that there are two individuals within this family, these two here, who must carry the genetic fault, but throughout their lives have been unaffected by the disease. And this is a phenomenon that we call non-penetrance. Uh, and it's quite clear from this family and other families that there are individuals who carry genetic faults throughout their life that do not develop the disease. And I'll say a little bit about that later on. So, Sean um, is the only surviving affected member of his family, and I'll, I'll come back to Sean later. So, we used Sean's family and two other families, one from the southwest of England and another from Belgium, in genetic studies nearly 20 years ago, and identified that in all three families there were genetic abnormalities in a substance called complement. And this is a simple cartoon of complement. And what complement is, it's the oldest immune mechanism that we have. And complement is designed to identify bacteria and viruses when they enter our body, coat the bacteria and viruses and destroy them. The trouble with complement is it's not very discriminatory and so will also coat our own cells in our body and could do damage to our own cells if that is left unchecked. So there's this substance here called C3, which combines with another factor, factor B, that gets deposited on the cell surface and goes on to cause damage to the cells. And it's for that reason that we have regulators, protector proteins, that protect against complement damaging our own cells. And the, the most important one probably is the substance called factor H that is produced in the liver that binds to our cells through this area here. It looks like a sort of string of pearls. There are also regulators that are permanently bound to cells. One's called MCP or CD46. And these regulators act in two ways to inactivate this complement substance here. They can act with a, a factor I substance, which directly snips into this substance and renders it inactive or they can increase the rate at which this spontaneously dissociates and becomes inactive. What we have found, and other groups through both Europe and the USA have found over the last 20 years, that up to about 70% of individuals, whether they be in a family or whether they have just presented as the only member of their family, have uh, either an inherited or acquired abnormality of complement. So they have either a, a genetic fault or they have antibodies. And so about 30% of people have abnormalities in factor H, about 10% in CD46, and you can see I've put the percentage. All the abnormalities on this side impair the ability of these regulator proteins to destroy the active complement here. There are also changes that increase the stability of this substance here, thus by rendering it less susceptible to these regulator proteins here. So about 30% of patients are at present, we don't know what the abnormality is, and that's a, a major thing that many research labs around the world are studying at the present moment. So I mentioned earlier that not everybody who carries a genetic fault will go on to get the disease. So we think there are probably three things that are necessary for an individual to manifest atypical HOS. So many individuals will carry a rare genetic fault or mutation is what we describe it. And on top of that, we think that some people will also need a common genetic variant in one of the complement genes that I've mentioned that increases your risk of developing the disease if you carry a mutation. But on top of that, you're also going to need a trigger that sets the whole disease going. So there are well-recognized triggers, such as the late stages of pregnancy, certain drugs, such as oral contraceptive. Although many people who, when they present with atypical HOS, report that they've had a flu-like illness, suggestive of either a bacterial or viral illness that seems to have set the disease going. Up till recently, the initial management of somebody who presented with atypical HOS was plasma exchange or plasma infusions. Although the evidence, and this is uh, taken from guidelines that we produced several years ago, although the evidence for the efficacy of this treatment was not fantastic. Um, uh, despite um, treatment with plasma exchange, 
a whole range of studies have shown that within two years of individuals first presenting with the disease, that the majority will have developed end-stage renal failure and need dialysis. This is some data taken from an Italian publication that uh, we worked on. Uh, the only group who seemed to do relatively well in this publication were those patients who only had an MCP mutation, a CD46 mutation. For those people who went on to dialysis, which was the majority, the outcome of transplantation was equally poor, with a very high recurrence rate according to the underlying mutation in most individuals, up to 100%. And once individuals had had a recurrence of a disease in a, a transplant, loss of a graft was virtually inevitable. The only group who seemed to do better from a point of view of transplantation than others were those who had a CD46 mutation alone. And even in that group, there is some recurrence. So, knowing that complement was the major abnormality in this disease, it became logical that one would want to try and use a complement inhibitor to treat the disease. And as many of you will know, there is only one licensed complement inhibitor, which is a Cluzumab. This is a letter that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine and describes one of the first cases that was treated on an anecdotal basis by a nephrologist in a young child who was one of those patients who actually had responded to plasma exchange and was maintained on regular plasma exchange, as you can see here, once every two weeks. And despite being on plasma exchange, the parameters used to assess the activity of atypical HUS shill showed that the platelet count was low, but a substance called LDH, which measures activity of the disease, was up. And at this stage here, the plasma creatinine started to deteriorate in this child, and it was felt that plasma exchange was no longer working. So based on the premise that a map should work, the clinician here started a map, and with that, the LDH fell, the platelet count came up, and the renal function returned to normal. And a variety of other clinicians around the world, including myself, all tried a map in this way in an anecdotal sense. Following on these anecdotal reports of the efficacy of Clusmab, trials were undertaken. I'm just going to show you the endpoints of these two trials. The first trial looked at the use of Clusmab in patients who presented for the first time, or had a recurrence in a transplant, or had relapsed. In these people, they were not responding to plasma exchange as evidenced by a low platelet count. So the plasma exchange was stopped and they were started on Eclusmab. And the primary, what we call endpoint, the evidence for efficacy of Eclusmab was the platelet count. And as you can see, in virtually everybody, the platelet count came up within a short period of time. And then here, in the long-term extension study, has remained stable in those patients who have been followed up in the study. What was very impressive in this study was that there were five patients on dialysis and four of them came off dialysis. And in my experience previously, it had been very rare for somebody who was not responding to plasma exchange to spontaneously come off dialysis. It usually meant that they would end up in end-stage renal disease. The other group of patients who were studied were those small number of patients who were in remission on regular plasma exchange. And the plasma exchange was stopped in those patients, and they were then started on a map. And the efficacy of that maneuver was measured by what's known as a TMA event-free status. And to be TMA event-free, there had to be no new plasma exchange, no dialysis, and no change in the platelet count. And this is the percent of patients at 26 weeks, one year, and two years who achieved that TMA event-free status. So 80, 85, and 95. And patients only failed to achieve that TMA of entry status because they had a transient decrease in their platelet count, which was self-limiting and came back to normal. So in these patients, it was possible to stop plasma exchange and for them to not develop a disease again whilst they were maintained on a map. So based on that trial data, uh, an application was made to the regulatory bodies, the FDA and the MA, the manufacturer Alexion, for a license to use a map in atypical HUS. And that was granted. 
So I'm now going to talk about what's happened in terms of that from uh, a, a UK perspective. So in England, very rare diseases such as atypical HS are managed through our nationalized health service, through what's known as a national specialized service, which is based in one center. And the national service for atypical HS, which is only currently an interim service, is based here in Newcastle. To become a national service, we had to apply to a body called the Advisory Group for National Specialized Services. And we did that in June 2012. And our government ministers, based on what they received from this group called AGNSS, agreed that was overwhelming evidence for the clinical effectiveness of Atuzumab, but wanted further evidence on whether the NHS, our National Health Service, could actually afford it. So they referred the affordability issue to another government body called NICE. However, the government decided through this organization called NHS England that in the interim, until NICE had made a recommendation about the affordability of Eclusimab, that they would fund Eclusimab for patients with atypical HOS in England and they would have funded for both new patients with atypical HS and also existing patients on dialysis suitable for a kidney transplant, but who needed a Clusmab to a transplant to be undertaken. So this is the interim national service that we have for atypical HS in England. In the meantime, NICE started their evaluation of the affordability of a Clusmab, and they published their initial consultation document in February of this year. They said that, in fact, they were unable to make a recommendation to the government at that time because they had not been presented with an adequate explanation for the considerable cost of the drug. So the committee were unable to prepare a recommendation and went back to the company, Alexion, to ask for further information to enable it to do so. At the same time, they asked our government body called NHS England, in essence, how much could NHS England afford to spend? on treating patients with atypical HS with a clues map. So the, the, the factors that they needed to take into account for that. So NICE just met last week and we will hear the outcome of the evaluation in September. So we're all keeping our fingers crossed for this. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about how we are managing atypical HS in England through our national service. And I'm going to divide it up into the various groups. So Incident patients are patients who present for the first time with the disease. The way that we manage this in the UK at the present moment is, first of all, we have to make a diagnosis. So we have in England what's known as an AHS rare disease group. And we decided that these were the criteria that we would use to make a diagnosis of HS, atypical HS. So we wanted to exclude things that looked like atypical HRS but was not atypical HRS, such as typical HRS, known as shigatoxin HRS, and a variety of secondary causes such as drugs, infection, and various other diseases that can look like atypical HRS when a patient first presents. There are also factors that we would include, such as a renal biopsy showing the typical features of atypical HRS, or the presence on investigation of these classical triad of a low platelet count, renal failure, and evidence of anemia. So when a clinician elsewhere in England admits a patient who they think might have atypical HRS, what we do is we ask them to complete what we call our AHS diagnostic checklist. And as you can see, this asks for a variety of information about the clinical history of the patient. And we suggest a series of tests that we would like to be undertaken. We ask the clinician to send this form back to us as soon as possible. And we don't require the results of all these tests to be available when they send the form back. The only tests that we ask them to have available is the ADAM TS13 activity to exclude this other disease called TTP. So once we get that form back, there are four of us in Newcastle who independently look at the information on this form and we ask ourselves two questions. Does this patient have atypical HS and would this patient benefit from treatment with the Clusman? Usually we come up with complete agreement and we decide that the patient does indeed have atypical HS. And if that's the case, then we go to NHS England and 
seek approval for funding for the occlusion map. And we get that back within about an hour. So within 24 hours of a patient presenting, we can have had approval for the occlusion map and the patient can receive their first dose. The patients are vaccinated both with the tetravalent meningococcal vaccine and the new group B strain vaccine called Vexera. We also recommend that all patients receive ciprofloxacin for two weeks, and then they go on long-term penicillin and erythromycin, and they stay on penicillin no matter what the response to the vaccine, so that we use a belt and braces approach to preventing meningococcal disease. Clusimab has started. The genetics tests, which are done here in Newcastle, are then available after eight weeks, and we'll look at those and, uh, and consider them. But we will continue a clues map for at least six months for everybody who's treated. What about prevalent patients on plasma therapy? So there are, we're up to recently a few patients who are undergoing regular plasma exchange. There's currently only one patient in the UK, and that patient is, is going to be staying on plasma exchange. The big group that has been in interest is prevalent patients who are on dialysis, those patients with atypical HRS who want to be considered for a transplant. Up to recently, most of the patients in England with the disease who were on dialysis were not on our transplant list because of the risk of recurrence of the disease. One thing that we had considered in the UK, like elsewhere in the world, is the use of liver kidney transplantation. Um, there have been 22 liver kidney transplants undertaken around the world, and this is the results of the first 15. Initially, the results were not good. And it wasn't until we started using prophylactic plasma exchange before the transplant and immediately after the transplant, the results started to improve. But even with that, when I look at what the one-year patient survival is, which is 74%, compared with a one-year patient survival, i.e. people being alive at one year post-operative, of 99% of kidney transplant, there are very few people who I see nowadays when a clusimab is available, who would want to consider a liver kidney transplant. So, at the beginning of April 2013, there were in England 40 patients, one child and 39 adults, who were on dialysis, who we felt would benefit from a clusimab transplantation. 16 had lost a transplant to recurrent disease, and 27 were known to have mutations in one of the uh, genes that I've already mentioned. There were 13 patients who didn't have a mutation in any of these genes, but interesting, those 13, five had lost a transplant to recurrent disease. To date, 11 of those patients have been transplanted, four of them were living donors. 10 of them were given prophylactic eclusmab, and one was given eclusmab for an early recurrence, and all the patients are doing well. No graft, no, none of the transplants have been lost to recurrent disease. We use a standard protocol, and we only undertake whatever considered transplantation without a clusimab in patients who are currently factor H antibody negative but have had a previous factor H antibody positive, and those patients who are C have only a CD46 um, mutation. We don't use a day one dose of clusimab. This is something that uh, some groups in France have been doing, and we, we could see no rationale for using a day one dose of clusimab. Uh, and the studies we've done show that with a preoperative dose, everybody's completely blocked on the first postoperative day. The other group that we see increasingly in our national specialist service are unaffected carriers. One of the families that we studied in our first study was this very large family from the southwest of England, where 25 members of this family had been affected to date, and we screened a large number of family and found there were 18 unaffected carriers. It's interesting in this family to see where the affected individuals have presented in relation to, this, to their age. So each of these bars represents somebody presenting with disease. So a group presented very early in life, another group presented in late teens and early adulthood, and another group presented in later life, and the latest age but somebody presented was 79. So we worked out in this family what the risk was of developing a disease for an unaffected carrier. And we said that the resist risk, which we call penetrance, was 64% by the age of 70. We used this figure of 64% as a worst case risk when we give it to other individuals 
who are known to be unaffected carriers. And there are probably, the risk is probably much less in such families where perhaps only one person to date has been affected. So, in the first year of the NHS England service, 44 patients in England have been treated with occlusmab, 15 children and 29 adults. Interesting to see this gender difference between the children and the adults, and I'll come back to that later on. Of these 44 patients, 23 were new patients, of whom three had had another family member affected, and 21 were patients who were already known to have the disease. Of the new patients, incident patients, there were 16 who had started dialysis by the time that the occlusimab was first given. Of these 16 people, eight of them have stopped dialysis. Of the seven adults who have not stopped dialysis, the clusimab has been withdrawn in six after six months of treatment and where there was no evidence that there was going to be any chance of recovery of renal function. Of the prevalent patients, there were 11 transplant patients, three were treated for recurrent disease and eight were given the disease prospectively. The other 10 patients were patients who were having it, were given it to prevent recurrent relapses. So, a big topic for us at the present moment is whether it's possible to discontinue clusimab in any patients. So this is our experience in the UK. We have withdrawn it in six patients who have not recovered renal function in response to be given a clusimab. In only one of those individuals has there been any evidence of extra renal recurrence of the disease and the other five, and that patient started back on a clusimab, the other five the occlusimab has been withdrawn and they remain on dialysis. In three patients who have recovered renal function, the occlusimab has been withdrawn and there's been no recurrence of the disease. All three of these patients did not have any mutations identified in any of the genes that I've mentioned previously. We wouldn't consider at present withdrawing occlusimab in any patient who'd been transplanted. In the Alexion registry, there are 17 patients, this is the international, who have discontinued it, and three have relapsed. There's also been a recent publication from an Italian group where they discontinued Eclusimab in seven patients, and in three of them there was a relapse. And these three, one, two, three, all of them had an abnormality in terms of a mutation or antibodies. And it's interesting that they pick the uh, recurrence of the disease up very quickly just by using urinalysis. So that the development of blood in the urine was an early sign of recurrence of the disease. And what was important is that each of these patients, when they started back on a clusmab, the renal function returned to what it had been previously. So they were completely able to recover the level of renal function that was present when they were previously on the occlusimab. So, I'm sort of coming up to the end of my talk and I just wanted to go full circle and say what's happened to Sean. And Sean's online and uh, he, he can add anything that he might want to add. But Sean has recently been transplanted and has done very well and I think has given him a new lease of life. And so it's remarkable that somebody who's been on dialysis 25 years with this condition has been transplanted. Uh, and I'm just delighted that Sean is doing so well with his uh, transplant. I want to say a little bit now about some of the comments on the results of the AHS global role. I'm just going to comment on one or two things that interested me. I've already mentioned earlier that in several studies that in adults, females are much more commonly affected than in males. And this is something that came out of the global poll. Now, this may be related to pregnancy or contraceptive as being a precipitating factor, but I think there are other factors, and this is something that we, as a research community, think is worth uh, uh, looking at further. I was quite impressed by how quick the time to diagnosis was in the majority of patients within the global poll. Our concern has always been that there may be significant delay in diagnosis, and the evidence is that the sooner you treat patients with occlusimab, the better the chance you will actually recover renal function. I was also quite impressed by the number of individuals who were getting genetic screening undertaken and the time that the genetic screening results were available. Again, there seemed to be a very large number, 48%, I think, of patients who were receiving occlusimab in the global poll. 
And that, that's good to hear that in countries around the world that many patients are getting the opportunity to be treated with this transformative treatment. One thing that was commented on is the willingness of patients with atypical HUS to be involved in research and the need for registries. So we are in, in the UK encouraging everybody to participate both in a, a UK-based registry that we have of atypical HUS and also the Alexion-based registry because it's only with registries like this that we'll learn more about the long-term response to Eclusimab and other important questions about the disease. I think a caveat about the whole results of AHS Global Poll, however, is when you look at the countries involved, so the majority of these countries were involved, UK, USA. And so you might say that the US the Global Poll has a degree of an ascertainment bias. So it may not be totally representative of what's going on in other countries where perhaps there aren't as active patient support groups and there aren't uh, there isn't access to uh, treatment or to diagnosis. But I thought they were fascinating results from the global poll. So I think that's my last uh, slide. So I'm available to take any questions, to try and answer anything uh, that anybody would like to ask me. So back to you, Rob. Okay, thanks very much for that uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Goodchip. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, so here, um, I'm just going to keep your slides there in case we want to refer to them again. Uh, here you can find uh, the chat box uh, where people can ask uh, questions uh, if they have them. Um, we also had a few questions emailed in uh, which maybe we can try to uh, address first uh, and as other people um, think they can type their questions. Uh, this question was from uh, Len uh, Woodward uh, in the UK, uh, and he says 80% of people in the poll said they would definitely be willing to take part in research. Uh, what do you see out of all the current uh, research, um, and if more people join, do you think research focus will shift in any way? So I think the sort of the things that we feel are important research questions at the present moment are. What are the causes of a disease in those individuals who we have not found a genetic or those 30 percent? Um, and are there any non-complement related genes that may be giving rise to the picture of atypical HRS that may not respond to a map? I think a big question is whether it is possible to withdraw a map safely in patients. And that would be something that we would be keen to undertake a, a study on with rigorous control. I think it would be interesting to look at other agents as well, and I know there are other uh, agents in preparation by various companies around the world to see whether other agents could be beneficial in, in treating this disease. So those are sort of the three things that uh, I'm keen to look at myself at the present moment. In terms of research, you mentioned taking part in the UK registry. Uh, how can someone who does not live in the UK take part in your registry? So there are two registries that are currently running in the UK. One is just for people, I'm afraid, in the UK, so we wouldn't be able to include in that somebody from another country because this is information that we want specifically from patients in the UK. There is, however, an international registry, which is the Alexion registry, so that is open to anybody anywhere with the disease. And patients who want to be included in that registry should speak to the clinician who is looking after them. Thanks very much. Uh, we had another question from uh, Len uh, from AHUS uh, UK. Uh, that we kind of touched on a bit earlier, but maybe you can comment on again. Uh, diagnosis of AHUS is improving all the time. The poll re uh, results showed that. Um, and in many ways, uh, compared to other diseases where people have a delay, uh, on average, the delay to diagnosis is seven years for a rare disease patient, and it's considerably less in atypical HUS. Uh, but Len is asking, do you think uh, one day there will be an even simpler and quicker test uh, for diagnosing or monitoring AHUS and in what time frame might they be available? So there's no one test that we can use at the present moment that is 
totally specific and totally sensitive for the diagnosis of a typical HUS. So I think it is unlikely at the present moment within the foreseeable future that we're going to have a single test when somebody comes in. And I think atypical HUS, like other the rare diseases, one of the problems is that because it is so rare that many family doctors will never see it in their life, and that in fact many hospital doctors will never see it. So it, it is it is being aware of the disease. I think what AHS UK has very importantly done is in those individuals where um, who we know have got the disease, where other family members may be at risk, we've produced a patient card for to give out to other family members, whether they are known to have a, be a carrier or not, so that listed on that card are the tests that we would suggest if somebody becomes unwell for a longer period of time than would be expected, that they can give to a doctor and say, these are the tests you need to do, and if they're, and if they're abnormal, they need to see a kidney specialist. Okay, thanks, Dr. Goodship. Um, uh, let's uh, interrupt these questions from email to uh, get to a question from Phyllis uh, from the Foundation for Children with Atypical HUS in the United States. Um, Phyllis this says, thanks. A quick question on the Italian results that you mentioned, uh, that reoccurrence was diagnosed quickly by a urinalysis. Were any of those patients ones that had blood in the urine normally and they could tell by an increase, or are they all cases of no blood in the urine normally? As far as I can see from the paper, these were individuals who had no blood in their urine at that time. So it was urine normally completely free of blood that then develops blood in the urine. OK, thanks, Dr. Goodship. Phyllis says thanks as well. Uh, this was another question about diagnosis uh, that came in via email uh, from the Italian patient group. Uh, if you feel like it's already been addressed, uh, let me know. But it says, do you think that fast, uh, or I guess, uh, faster genetic research could be useful in order to administer the, e uh, the equalizumab in view of a possible interruption of the treatment after the first severe period of AHUS? So currently, I don't think that knowing the genetic tests immediately would change whether or not I give somebody a map. The reason for that is that we know from the studies that there are patients who have no genetic abnormality identified who seem to respond to map. So I think that the way we are doing it at the present moment is that if somebody has a clinical diagnosis of atypical HUS, we would treat them with a map. We would then wait for the results of genetic tests and take time looking at them. But the modern techniques allow you to get genetic results very quickly. So I could perhaps get results in 24 hours on somebody. But it's interpreting those results that is really important. And that's what takes the time is to sit down and say, is this abnormality really an abnormality that's causing the disease? And that can take some time. OK, uh, thanks very much. Um, so I see some other people are typing, so please feel free to submit your questions. If not, I just have a few more uh, via email um, that came in. Uh, I don't know if you uh, would like to comment on this. What do you think about the dosage of uh, equalizumab and the relative frequency of uh, administration of the medication? Um, of course, it's going to be different for each individual uh, dosage, and it's something that has to be dealt with with their individual doctor. So the recommend in England at the present moment in terms of monitoring the efficacy, how well eclusumab is working, is that you should have evidence that complement is completely blocked. The tests that we use, probably the names mean nothing, but they're called an AH50 and a CH50. And what we want to see in patients on eclusumab is that just before they get their next dose of eclusumab, that there is no evidence of complement activities, i.e. the complement pathway is still blocked. So that if you were going to either reduce the dosage or increase the interval, you would want to be checking before that new lower dosage or that new higher dosage or that extended interval. It's checking just before that next dose of eclusumab that the complement is still blocked, because if it's blocked then, it will be blocked for the whole of the preceding period of time since the last dose. 
Okay, uh, and a question from Michael. Uh, if someone has been on dialysis for several years, what is the chance that this person can come off dialysis if they would start on uh, equalizumab without a transplant? I would say it's pretty slim. Um, how, how late it is before you could give a equalizumab is a question I don't know. So if somebody had, say, been on dialysis three or four years and they were not passing any urine, I think the chance that their kidneys would get any function back is, is slim. What we would do here is we would first of all do an ultrasound of the kidneys to see whether or not the kidneys had shrunk to a level at which there was no chance they would. In one or two patients, we've actually done a kidney biopsy and those patients who are not on dialysis and don't seem to have recovered so that we can look specifically at the kidney tissue and see whether or not we think there's any chance that the kidneys could recover. Okay. Um, we have another question here. Um, Michael says, thanks, great. Uh, my daughter has a factor H mutation. No one else in my family or my wife's family have the disease. We are planning on doing tests for mutations for the rest of our children and ourselves. What, if any, other genetic mutations have been identified that may combine with the factor H mutation to affect the penetrance of this disease? Okay, so sometimes we find that somebody has got more than one mutation and that has been inherited from different members of the family, mother and father. So if you carry more than one, but if somebody's only got one mutation, um, there are other common occurring genetic variants that seem to increase or decrease the risk. I think the difficulty is in predicting whether or not other members of a family might become affected, that I tend to be a little bit cautious about measuring these in other in members and saying, you're at no risk at all if you're a carrier or you are at risk. So I, uh, I think one has to be cautious. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question that uh, I got via email. Um, do you think that a longer period in between uh, equalizumab administration could have a significant impact on the relevant costs and English patients could obtain positive advantages, I guess, from uh, less frequent dosage? So I think it, it, it could. Uh, so but by decreasing the interval, obviously, you're going to use less occlusumab, and that would bring down the cost. One would have to check, as I've already mentioned, that when one decreases the interval, that the, at the end of that period of time, the interval, that the complement is still blocked. You wouldn't want a period of time when you're releasing the complement system by not having uh, sufficient occlusumab available. I think that I would be more interested to see whether people could do completely without occlusumab and, and withdraw, but actually increase the interval. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, this is the last um, question um, that I received. Uh, can there be low-level complement activity in organs other than the kidneys prior to an AHUS relapse? And if so, how is this tested for? So many people I have seen do say that before they become unwell with the kidney disease, that they have other symptoms from other parts of their body and wonder whether there could be AHAS affecting those. I think it's very difficult to say that. I certainly think it's a possibility. I think one would have to, at the time that one had those symptoms, do tests to see if there was any evidence of AHAS affecting the disease, the, 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 those organs. But I, I think it's a very important question and certainly some, something that we would want to try and look at in a, in a research setting. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, just a comment there from Sean. Uh, hi, Professor Goodship. Thank you for giving me my life back. My life back. Uh, Equalismab has completely turned my life around. Thank you forever, Sean from the UK. Uh, and that was the, the gentleman that uh, Dr. Gritchett was mentioning in his presentation. Thanks for that comment, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Um, so, uh, I see a few more people um, maybe typing a last question. 
Um, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Goodchip for his time. Um, this was really uh, appreciated uh, today, uh, something I know all the AHUS patient groups were really looking forward to. Um, Dr. Goodchip uh, often gives his time to uh, patient groups and to patients, um, so this is uh, you know, following in that same vein, uh, and we, uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, so thanks on behalf of everyone. Um, I also want to remind you uh, that this recording will be available on the Atypical HUS community. Uh, on Rare Connect uh, within a few days. Um, and is it okay to share your slides there as well, Dr. Goodchip? Yep, that's fine. Okay, and um, yeah, we'll have the, the slides there as well uh, for anybody that wants to, to see them. Uh, another question from Michael uh, as we're ending here today. Uh, do you recommend that everyone in a family that is affected by AHUS be tested for the disease, even if they don't present any symptoms? So we see quite a lot of families and we go through them the benefits of being tested so that a lot of adults in the family who might be at risk do want to be tested to see if they carry uh, uh, an abnormality that we know is likely to be the cause of the disease in the individual. Sometimes it's much more difficult in knowing what to do with children the current recommendations for testing of children with genetic, at risk of genetic diseases in the UK is that one wouldn't want to test somebody unless there was a, an immediate initial benefit to a child of having that test undertaken. And that one perhaps should let the child get to an age where the child themselves can have some say as to whether or not they want to be tested. What we tend to do with children is that if parents want to have the child tested after due consideration, then we test the child. Some parents do decide to have their children tested, some decide just to wait and uh, let the child make a decision themselves later in life as to whether. No matter what, whether the child is tested or not, the parents are still aware of that child, if they don't know if it is or is not a carrier, is at risk of the disease. And so with the cards that AHS UK provide, they have all the information should the child become unwell. Uh, okay, um, so if you have any other burning last questions, you can uh, share them on the AHUS community. Uh, I just want to uh, thank everyone for joining us uh, today. This is Rob uh, from Eurodis, um, uh, inviting you to join the, the Atypical HUS community on Rare Connect. Uh, and find the video there in a few days. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goodship. Uh, and uh, yeah, any, any final comments you want to say to everyone? Um, no, but just a couple of things. Thank you all for, for listening, for perhaps some of you staying up late and some of you getting up very early. Um, I think I would like to say what a fantastic job the patient family groups are doing. So around the world, AHS UK Foundation for Children, the Spanish, Australian, all those groups are doing fantastic. I don't think, speaking from a UK perspective, that we would be where we are without AHS UK through what they've done. I don't, I think it would I, I think the fact we have a Cluzumab available, a huge uh, uh, round of applause should go to AHS UK for what they've done. And I think a huge um, thank you to the Foundation for Children for Atypical HUS for, for funding research and for all that they've done. It's been fantastic. So, But not only those two groups, but all the groups, I think, are doing a fantastic job. Yeah, uh, and we've been, you know, talking a lot uh, with the groups on the community and, and by email that uh, there's just even more willingness to, to work together uh, and to even create a, a global uh, alliance for uh, atypical HUS to, to carry out projects and, you know, uh, participate with, with uh, researchers and, and things like that. So uh, we, we see that uh, kind of cooperation just uh, continuing. Uh, and from the Eurodis perspective, just want to encourage that uh, as much as we can. And this webinar was hopefully a, an opportunity to, to do that as well. Uh, so wherever you are, uh, have a good uh, rest of your day. Uh, and Dr. Goodship, thank you uh, very much uh, on behalf uh, of everyone. So this is the end. Bye now. <laughs>